Mike asked me to to read a couple. He's going to teach out of out of First Samuel today, so we'll hit a couple of of other uh, passages. First of all, Psalm 56. Um, then we'll jump into First Samuel, and then back to Psalm 34. Um, but Psalm 56, supplication for deliverance and grateful trust in God. So Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My my foes have trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid." What can mere man do to me? All day long they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth. In anger, put down the peoples, O God. You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. And they not in your are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. And then our passage this morning, 1 Samuel 21, um, 13 through 15, but I'll start in... in verse 12. So 1 Samuel 21, verse 12. David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? And then lastly, real quickly in Psalm 34, just the superscription, Psalm 34 a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. With that, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I greet you on this October 7. October 7th, a year ago, we had the attack in... Is this not the 7th? Uh, We had the attack in Israel, uh, and uh, we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, so let's remember to do that and pray. And then um, then, uh, lesson 23 is where we are this morning. Uh, In our previous lesson, we closed with the prophetic certainty uh, that the Philistines rendered regarding David and the kingdom, saying he is the king of the land. And we say rightly so to that. Uh, It is a prophetic certainty. Uh, He was anointed by Samuel the prophet, and... uh, We had the exchange of garments uh, symbolically identifying him as the king. He did that with Saul in his armor 
before he went out to face Goliath. And then Jonathan uh, exchanged garments with him, again, symbolically identifying him as the king next in line, uh, taking his place, Jonathan. Uh, sealed by the covenant loyalty of, of uh, both men, David and Jonathan, 1 Samuel 20. Uh, Jonathan verbally giving David the recognition of first place above himself. That, my friends, is called, by the way, uh, spiritual leadership. Giving others first place, according to the Lord Jesus. Welcome to the kingdom. And finally, the affirmation, not from any man or prophet, not from any people, but from the Lord Himself. The Spirit that had one time been on Saul now rested on David. Whatever the motive was of Achish and his servants that they consciously thought of those words, David, the king of the land, you and I understood them quite well. Uh, the Scriptures are inspired, they are God-breathed, and they are absolutely true without any error. David's superiority was not only among his people, but among the Philistines as well. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 30. The princes of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than the servants of Saul. So, his name was highly esteemed among them all. If you really want to know your worth, you will find it among those who have to compete against you. Uh, when I was in the natural gas business, I would often have to compete heads up with the now forlorn and degraded name of Enron. But back in my day, they were the, considered the gold standard of the energy business. Now, what I want us to do this morning is become keen students of the life of David. So, you may not be aware of our narrative but it has two psalms specifically tied to this short passage of narrative. So, we not only want to know the story of David, but we want to think David's thoughts after him. So, look at this inscription, superscription of the first psalm, Psalm 56. And here is the historic setting to the psalm itself. To the choir master, according to the dove on a far off terebinth, a mitkam of David. And we're not sure of what all those words mean, unfortunately. The rabbis didn't leave us enough information. But here's what's important for our study this morning. Look at the setting. When the Philistines seized him at Gath. So we're right where we are in the narrative. Now, this morning, I'm not here to detail these psalms. I'm going to leave that to better teachers. What I want to really take aim at, and I, what I want us to come away with, is the mind of David. That's what's really important, practically speaking. Uh, the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's what I want. Uh, as a man thinks, says the proverb, so is he. So I desperately need to think like David because he is terrified. 
He's frozen, if you will. And uh, I often find myself in those situations. Um, these blasts of uh, providence, like the hurricane that hit our country. And these people have had their entire lives just suddenly in a matter of hours washed away. Now, how do you deal with that? That's what I want to focus on. The mind of David. And the second attempt uh, of instruction this morning is I want to interact with current interpretations of this event with Achish. Um, I disagree with a lot of teachers on this point. Very popular, powerful Bible teachers. Um, so I'm going to give you a different view. And, uh, and I'm going to preface it this way. It's all history. Uh, all the facts of history need interpretation. Now that you have to kind of think about and absorb for a moment. But tomorrow, for example, is October 8. And... <laughs> Not October. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Don Larson on October 8th, uh, he pitched the perfect game in the World Series, uh, Yankee Stadium. That has never been done before. And uh, the Houston Astros pitched a perfect game a few years ago, but they used four pitchers to do it. Don Larson did it all by himself. Nine innings, perfect game. Now, imagine you went to that game, somebody gave you a ticket, you had never been to a baseball game in your life. You don't even know how the game is played. And, uh, but you're sitting right behind the plate and you're watching this game. And here's what would happen at the end of the game. Um, the... The uh, Yogi Berra, the catcher, the third strike, he jumps up, he throws his mitt, he throws off his face mask, and he runs over and jumps into the arms of Don Larson. Now, you're sitting there, you've never been to a baseball game, you're going, my, that's quite an event. Suddenly, the team comes out and mobs Don Larson. They lift him up on their shoulders. And the crowd goes crazy. And you think, wow, I need to start watching baseball. <laughs> now, you watched the game, but you didn't watch it like the guy next to you. Because he's been a Yankee fan all his life. And you look at him and you say, boy, isn't this exciting? And he has got tears rolling down his face. You saw the same event, but you saw it completely differently. He had all this knowledge. He had all this understanding. This is an event. This is a historic event. This has never been done before. But you wouldn't know. So, we look at history, narrative, and we need to interpret it carefully because... All history needs to be interpreted. And we use the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us in our interpretation. So I'm going to have a different view than what you've probably been taught or considered. But I give that to you. I feel comfortable with my position. Now, you may recall earlier... When Saul saw David as a threat, that occurred back in chapter 18. He sent him out to fight the Philistines with the secret hopes that they would kill him. No. Get him! Get him! Um, and now our narrative tells us, 1 Samuel 21, they've got their hands on him. Oh, man, 
He's getting his wish, right? This is an answer to prayer for Saul, right? Now, the voice of David. Psalm 56. Here it is. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long. An attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. For many attack me proudly. Observe the repetitions. First, to trample. The word in the King James is to swallow up. And that's really a pretty good translation. Job 5.5, 5, used of a robber. Um, I take your Cartier diamond bracelet and I put it in my bag and I get on the horse and I run away. It's swallowed up. It's gone. That's the idea of the word. Uh, second, observe he. He's identified as an attacker. That occurs twice. The word means to fight. Psalm 35 verse 1. Used of a warrior's aggression in battle. So, in the context of David's life, he's been running, and his enemies are on the attack. And worse than that, they keep coming. Now, I'm going to date myself. I'll tell you how old I am. I'm a lot older than you are. Um, back in 1969, the big hit movie was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It was so popular. Lines formed uh, every Friday and Saturday night. I know, I stood in them to watch Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It's the first time that two colossal stars, uh, Robert Redford, Paul Newman, acted in a story together. They acted these characters, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, they were rogues. They were robbers. But they weren't bank robbers like we think of going in and sticking up the bank. No, they robbed the trains that carried the money. And uh, they were very clever fellows. Um, and the railroad who had to pay out to the banks all this cash that got robbed away, they had had enough. So they're going to hire a professional posse. I mean, these guys are pros. Not, hey, Bill, hey, Tom, you know, ride, ride together with me. And No, no, these guys were pros. And, uh, and, and Sundance and Butch, they created all kinds of diversions to scatter their trail here and yon. But it didn't fool them. Man, it just, that's no big deal at all. And so what you had in the script is this constant refrain between the two. And they would look at one another and look back at that posse chasing them. And they'd say, who are these guys? Who are these guys? Well, that's our word right here, oppression. The enemy oppresses me. The idea is to pant. That's the word. Like an animal is on a scent. And that's the way David thought about his enemies. They've got my scent in the air. And then here's your last double refrain. All day long. Repeated twice, see? There seems to be no end to this period of my life. Uh, I, I hear them in the night. Uh, I hear them in the morning. I hear them in the afternoon. I, I hear my enemies coming after me. Now they've got me. They've got their hands on me. And they are going to either arrest me one way or they're going to kill me another. Now verses 3 and 4. Here's his voice. Here's his instruction. The mind of David. 
When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, he says. Look at that opening, when. That's probably the most important word in the entire verse. Because it is a setting, an occasion, a time, a providence. It sets the scene. When fear comes, what does David do? He calls out to God in steadfast trust. That's what he does. It's a concentrated focus. The, the thoroughbred racehorse, some, in order to keep him straight, they put the blinders on the side so he doesn't get distracted left or right. He's just running straight. That's the idea of what David is doing. He's concentrating on the Lord and His personal Word. In God, he says, whose word I praise. Now, I ask you last lesson when we were together. Um, what is the word of God that he particularly has spoken to you or to your life or to your, your providence that you're in right now? Has he revealed himself to you in a certain word or promise? If he has, you believe it with all your heart, all your mind, all your energy, despite whatever the circumstances are. You just focus on that word. And let me say one other thing. Editorial comment. I preface it. The word. The word. That's what David was feeding on. What is the emphasis at Believer's Chapel? It's always been the Word. Oh yeah, I, I, I used to go to Believer's Chapel. I don't go anymore. Uh, we have robes and candles and choirs and we have, uh, we have a beautiful uh, lighting arrangements and uh, we drape our, uh, our crosses with uh, all kinds of figurative things, festive occasions. But yeah, I, I remember Believer's Chapel. I really grew. You know, you, they emphasized the Word there. Yeah, that's right. Aren't we so grateful for the elders that God has given this church to guide us and lead us in that Word that has protected this congregation and this church I hope you feel that way. I certainly do. I'm so grateful for them. You know what I think this word is for David? I think it's 1 Samuel 16, 12. You don't need to turn there. That's where the Lord told Samuel the prophet, now go find him and anoint him. Pour oil on his head and say these words to him. You are the new king of Israel. Now I think that's what David heard, and I think that's what David believed. Despite whatever was going on in his life, and so his conclusion is, what can man or flesh do to me? I'm the king. Somehow, some way, I'm the king. And... Uh, the providence is aside. Now that's thinking Scripture and not thinking my circumstances. I'm not thinking the diagnosis that the doctor gave me. I'm not thinking about what my employer told me that we're going to eliminate your job. That's fine. But here's what is really of substance in my life. It's what the Lord has said to me despite my circumstances. Let me illustrate. You know, the best illustrations are always from the Bible. In Acts 27, you don't turn there, just hear me out. Paul is aboard a ship out in the Mediterranean. You're familiar with the story, Believer's Chapel, you know these things. 
There's a terrifying storm in Acts 27. And it's so powerful, and it's so dark, and it's so foreboding, that even the sailors... Now, friends, you've got a problem when you're out there, and the sailors go, we're lost. <laughs> now, you know, I like to run and have sand under my feet. There's no sand out there. And now the s sailors say you're a goner. Uh, Dr. Lou describes it this way. When neither sun or stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. And so, um, with all men in total despair, when everybody had given up hope everywhere, suddenly this little Jewish Roman prisoner <coughs> steps in the middle and says, Last night there stood before me an angel of God whom I served, saying to me, Fear not. What did David say? When I'm afraid, when I'm afraid, and what did the angel say to Paul? Fear not. Don't be afraid. You must be brought before Caesar. Wow. They're going to be saved. That's what he tells them. And his immediate counsel for the day, be of good cheer. For I believe it will be just as he told me. Now you be of good cheer. Despite whatever the diagnosis is. Whatever the, the appalling providence that you're in right now. Be of good cheer. Because God has got a plan and He's got an end to that plan. Here's what is significant, I think, about that story. It's what the angel didn't tell Paul that I think is so significant for us all. Because we're all living here together on this planet in day and time, in space. What he didn't tell him is you got two more weeks of this storm, pal. <laughs> And then, you're going to get shipwrecked. You're going into the ocean. And then you're going to dry off on the island of Malta. And you're going to make a fire. And in making the fire, a viper is going to come up and bite your hand. And all the natives that are familiar with that viper are going to say, yeah, just watch this. Watch him swell up. Keep watching his eyes. Man, is he going down. And nothing happened. You know why nothing happened? Because God has got a plan and a purpose. And it's never what you think it is. Uh, David says in Psalm 56, When I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. He keeps his eyes, his heart, and his mind steadfast on the Lord. Now, 1 Samuel 21. Here's our narrative. Verse 13. So, what did David do? He's in Achish presence, surrounded by Philistines. <laughs> is a way out of this. And David disguised himself in their eyes, and he acted like a madman. Now, you probably don't have that verse highlighted. But I sure do. And here's why. I know David as a shepherd. I know David as a warrior. But I had no idea of David as a thespian. He's an actor. Let me let you in on a little secret. The f funniest guy in my personal life, is Dan Duncan. He makes me laugh. He tells me stories. He's got little voices in that head of his. He can do all these accents. And it's crippling. I can't stop laughing. But you'd never know that. Surprising, isn't it? That's really his gift. He's got a real talent for it. I've seen him sit at the table with 20 men and they're roaring. 
Dan Duncan. Who would have thought? <laughs> David. Look at him. Who would have thought? He's an actor. Isn't he amazing as a person? I didn't know you could do that, people say. Yeah. Now, this is why I want to engage in, the, in some interpretations. Because I read a lot of things that people say about David. And all interpretations are not the same. Uh, I don't know why some teachers of David say, look how he humiliated himself. Uh, he acted like a complete fool. Here's a quote. Uh, the king-elect feigned himself mad. Such was the condition in which he had sunk. Well, I don't see it that way at all. Look, our historian has already told us he is a young man. And he's scared to death. Can you imagine? You walk down the street and the van pulls up next to you and the sliding door opens and the next thing you know, they put a black bag over your head. They throw you into the van. Well, you'd be terrified. Give the guy a break. Look, our, our historian has already told us about David. And now we have read Psalm 56. We've read his testimony. What does he do when he's terrorized in a condition of paralysis by fear? He trusts God. Verse 13 tells us exactly what he did. In his own words, he was in the valley of the shadow of death and he acted his way out of it. Huh. Isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic? Why, well, if that had been Dan Duncan, Akish would be sitting there going, Get him out of here! Get him out! I can't take anymore! The Lord was with him and enabling him. And that's such a blessing. Here's what is undebatable historically, the narrative. The Philistines considered him the king of the land. He was the king. They, the Gentiles, called him the king, not the people of Israel. And this king of the land was in their presence. They had their hands on him. And yet, he slipped right through their fingers by clever tactics. Verses 14, 15, Achish said to his servants, Lo, look at this madman. Why do you bring him to me? If you really, I pondered that statement a lot. And it appears to me a mixture of both pity and revulsion. God, get him, get him away. Now, and everybody that touched him, wash your hands. Um, he wanted the disgusting man out of his sight. This word madman is found three places in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 9, Hosea 9, and Jeremiah 29. It's uh, an intense, overpowering behavior that's rather frightening. And that's what they saw. And then this statement from Achish, am I a, one of madmen? Now this is the punchline. This is the joke in the sermon and everybody laughs. But you're missing the point. This isn't a joke line. You see that phrase, in want of? It refers to Achish in his house. He was hoping that David would become a mercenary soldier for him. I've seen this guy. He's deadly. 
Man, I wish I could recruit him in to the Philistine army to be a, a consultant, an agent for me. That's what he's asking. That was what he was hoping. Now today, David's going to escape. He's going to have tricked them. Later, in Providence, that's 1 Samuel 27, he's going to be back under the domain of Achish. And guess what he does then? He tricks him again. Achish thinks one thing. David was, in fact, doing something else. But here he is, this day, this time, this hour. Here he is in the presence of all the brass of the Philistines and the king himself. And he is weak and he is broke and he has nowhere to go. And he tricked them. Isn't that wonderful? Why would anyone find fault with that? Beats me. Don't we all want to join in and sing the doxology at this point? I do. And that's the whole point of the second psalm in the story. It's Psalm 34. Look at the superscription of Psalm 34. Yeah, see, you're becoming great students of the rise of David. Here's the second psalm. These psalms are not in chronological order that we're presenting them, but we're presenting them to you in historic order. Specifically, what do I mean? Well, Psalm 56 is the prayer for deliverance. And Psalm 36 is the answer to that prayer. And David's praise for the prayer being answered. Look at the superscript. Of David when he disguised himself as insane before, and here he's called Abimelech, that is Achish. You should have a footnote somewhere on your Bible pointing out that Abimelech is a title and it's given that title to the Philistine king. And so, here's the end of the superscript. He drove him out and he went away. Well, I think of that in my mind. I can't get off of the idea of the swinging doors of a saloon and they pick that drunk up and they throw him through those swinging doors and out into the street he goes in the mud. That's kind of the picture. Drove him out. That's funny. Because you just threw out the most important man alive in the world. David. Who is the king of the land. Listen to his voice. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Look at verse 4. I sought the Lord. That's the previous psalm. And He answered me. He rescued me from all my fears. When I'm afraid, I will trust in You. Now, I don't know the providence God has you in this morning. I don't know all the exigencies to that providence. If this, then this, and then this, and on this, and this, upon this. I don't know what all those are. But here's what I can tell you. The Lord is powerful. Trust Him. And He will deliver you from... Would you write down, underline, make a note, all. A-L-L. -L. Not some. Not a portion of. All. That's what He does. All. All my fears. Isn't that wonderful? 
Look at verse 7, and with this I'll close. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now, look at that verse again. Look at it. I've got a question for you. If the angel of the Lord is encamped around you, encamped around David, and if the will of God goes through David, then it goes through you too. Because we are just like him. We are people after his own heart by faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the heir of David. If that's the case, that the angel of the Lord encamps around us, where are you in that verse? You ever thought about it? Where am I in that verse? I see the angel of the Lord. I, I see the camp. I see what he tells me. But where am I? I'm in the center. I'm in the, I'm in the bullseye. In the midst of a storm on the sea for Paul. In the midst of the throne room of Achish. Where I think my life's going to be snuffed out like that. Where am I, Lord? You're right in the very center. And you can't get away from it. This past week, visited with a father, a really, really man of the Word. He said, let me tell you about my youngest son. He graduated from college and he said, Dad, I want to go in the military. I said, son, I support you 100%. I'm going to be a Marine, Dad. So, off he goes. He's now a Marine. And like a Marine, we have this war in Iraq. And he says, you know, in order to move up my military career, I need to be in combat. So this Marine boy volunteers for combat, goes halfway around the world, and they put him in a Humvee in Fallujah, the Battle of Iraq and the famous Battle of Fallujah. Now he's in the top of this Humvee, and he's got this powerful machine gun. And one day they're driving down the street, and one of the enemies takes one of those RPOs, that's a rocket that sits on your shoulder, and he fires that missile, that rocket, right at the turret, the head, the top of that Humvee, where he's sitting. Now, the laws of physics tell you that if you have a stationary target, and that missile comes in, what happens? Everything explodes up. So that boy is going to be thrown 30, 60 feet in the air with body parts probably everywhere. But that's not what happened. Instead, that turret where he is at the top of that Humvee went straight down. It defied the laws of physics. They brought that Humvee back and this boy didn't have a scratch. That missile threw him down into the vehicle. And the vehicle sped away without a top. And the men back at the base said, I've never seen anything like this. Never. His Commanding officer said, you're the luckiest guy I ever saw. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him. My friends, 
You can't get out of the will of God. The will of God has got you. What I desperately need every day is to walk with Him and follow Him and listen to Him and talk to Him. I need that connection. And everything will take care of itself because God has got a plan and the end of that plan for David is the throne. The end of that plan for Paul was Caesar, his house in Rome. The end of that plan for you and me is heaven. May God give us the grace to believe His Word. His Word. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study together this morning. Guide, guard, and direct us in Your providence. Thank You for Your sovereign plan of identifying us and putting us in David's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen.